and welcome back to The Stone of Stumbling. This is episode two. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors at Candlelight, and we got such a good response from last episode that we are glad and pleased to have John Leffler back in the studio with us, and we're just going to pick up where we left off, John. In our last episode, we covered the historic situation in so-called Palestine, leading us up to where we are today. We're now at a point where there's a battle in Rafah about to take place. Israel is determined, and it seems like getting closer than ever, to the elimination of Hamas. That's the goal. That is the goal, and it's been the goal as long as I can remember in the right quarters, but they're close now. And then there's all this diplomacy and back-channel talking going on back and forth, and Let's just pick up where we left off and continue the conversation about Jerusalem, the stone of stumbling, in light of really recent developments. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of back-channeling going on. The Biden administration is trying to uh, force a two-state solution as we move on this. And so they're talking to the Arab countries, largely the ones that were part of the Abraham Accords. Mm-hmm. Uh, and notably, Israel's being left out of this conversation. That's the important, of course. The important part of this. And I said, oh boy. What's here. wrong with that? <laughs> well, here, here it comes. And the reason I say here it comes is what's going to happen is uh, they will formulate this plan and slam it together and then dictate it to Israel. In other words, it's going to be a diktat, probably including something like going back to the 1967 borders. We, we don't know yet. I haven't heard any leaks come out of the, the intelligence segments there, you know. So oh, here we go all over again. So here we go all over again. And, what, and this is what we need to talk about this morning is the, the breakdown of what's going on in the Middle East versus the narrative in the Western media. Because the Western media narrative is controlling what all these people in the streets of London and New York and everywhere chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, is all about. And most of it's misinformation. That's right. And that narrative spills right up to candlelight in our own comments page, in our own message, message section. Uh, I have a comment from our page, and I, if you don't mind, I'm just going to share this yeah, please, with you. Yeah, please, please. We need to take this art. But this is what we are hearing. Candlelight Christian Fellowship Free Palestine. The fact that you support the genocide Israel is committing against Palestinians that have lived there for hundreds of years is appalling to God. Israel is a racist apartheid state, has illegally murdered and stolen Palestinians' lands, farms, and homes. How dare you support such evil and vile things? Does it sound like I'm not sure, trying to be fair to this comment? How dare you support such evil and vile things that the Israeli government is doing to civilians and children? You should be ashamed of yourself. And this is my favorite. Jesus and God do not support this at all. You are mistaken. So we have a spokesman for Jesus and God telling us that we're wrong on this whole issue, John. Right. Well, uh, the part that I liked when I was reading these, because I read through a bunch of these, these, some are a lot worse. And I suspected that this one was probably a bot uh, or it was from somebody's website, propaganda website, because it's well written. And if you're dealing with anybody below a certain age, they can't read, write, spell, or punctuate. And uh, liberally, this was a little too articulate to be a, <laughs> this was too, an actual critic. But it was representative. You know, when I got done reading, I thought, well, you definitely, you scurrilous knave, you, you putrid pile of pusillanimous spots. I am outraged, you know. And I thought, okay, whatever. Uh, we've heard outrage in the American body politic for, what, 50 yeah. years now? And it doesn't mean anything. Because when words become weaponized, they go through three Three stages, Jason. Uh, the first stage is it really means something, like the word racist. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants to be a racist in their right minds, right? That's right. And so when they use racist and you throw that, they go, oh, no, I'm, I'm not a racist. Uh, let me back off, right? But then the second stage it goes into, it works so well at intimidating your political enemies that they broaden the definition mm-hmm. out, 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 out like that. And it still has its effect. Mm-hmm. But finally, you get to the point where it's so broad and so widely misused that nobody cares. And so you finally, we w- and we're getting to that in this country. You're a racist. Yeah. So well, what? and John, the reason we need to answer this in light of the stone of stumbling in today's episode is because Christians are swayed by this. That's correct. Our own people are swayed by this, and they're kind of baffled. They get caught in the middle. They sway back and forth. And part of what we want to do is just kind of set the record straight and keep it straight because developments are hot and they're happening, and people need to kind of be helped right? I mean, clarity is necessary. Okay, let's look at how, what's going on, uh, the factions involved, 
and then the media involvement. So before we, I really do want to address every single Absolutely. item in this uh, email because I would be outraged at myself if any of the facts in here were true, and none of them is true. Not a single one in this whole uh, message to us was true. And we need to unpack what it means when you say, from the river to the sea, what does it mean when you support Israel? But, but let me explain something, okay? Um, the factions surrounding the Middle East are multiple, and the Western narrative that we get in the media is reflective of the Western cultural wars that are going on in which mm -hmm. everything, now the culture war, everything is, I'm, I'm always getting two sentences on top of each other here, the Western cultural war is a Marxist one. It's cultural Marxism. It was brought into the West by the Frankfurt and Leipzig schools in Germany. They fled to the United States uh, during the 1930s with the Nazis. They set up school and shop in the teachers colleges of the United States. And by the 50s, they had major influence over the teachers that were coming out. You saw the first effects of this in the 60s and the revolution of the flower child movement, the uh, peace, the sex, free sex, free drugs movement. This was all part of this cultural Marxism. And Marxism works on the principle of a dialectic, that in order to get to this great utopia that we are supposed to be getting to, you have to create this division. And was, that's the operational principle. That's the operational they, principle. They, they're not right. forthcoming about this. No, 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 no. They yeah. won't tell you that. But it's a dialectic. Saul Alinsky said in his interview with the National Public Radio shortly before he passed away in the early 1970s, he said that friction makes the whole thing work. Mm -hmm. So he knew you have to get X fighting Y, thinking that the other parties, these are all the problems back and forth. And they're just, and we see that in the American body politic. You see it in Canada, you see it in Europe. Uh, but in reality, they're moving you to position Z, and yeah. you don't know that's where you're going. And what was the goal? Yeah. Marxism. The whole it's, window moves. The whole window moves. The positions moves, right. of left and right appear the same relative to each other. Correct. But the whole thing is moving in their direction. That's correct. And so everything today is divided up into racist, anti-racist, oppressor, oppressed, colonialist, colonialist, oppressed, blah, blah, blah. The problem is, is that narrative doesn't really fit what's going on in the Middle East. The other problem that we're having in the West... Palestine is okay. the perpetual victim. That's Israel right. Israel is the perpetual oppressor. Those are ontological categories, supposedly, in the narrative. That's correct. Yeah. And so Israel can do no good. Palestine can do no bad. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that. The other problem we're having in the West that's really important to understand is what I call we have now entered the era of collapsing narratives. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can think of everything from climate change to energy to, I'm trying to think about things, sociological issues. Mm -hmm. uh, let me give you an example in climate change. Okay, we've heard for over 30 years since the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in 1992, uh, we've heard this constant drumbeat that carbon dioxide is heating the atmosphere, the planet's going to heat up, blah, blah, blah. Let's stipulate, let's say that's true. Okay, we've had 30 years of this. The media are on board. Da, 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 boom, boom, I dare you, tune into any show on public television. And today we're going to paint this beautiful painting here, and it'll show how climate change is affecting paints. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you, you can't get away from it. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the gorilla in the room, or what I call the dead horse syndrome? All right, the dead horse in the room is that even if that's all true, let's stipulate that it's true. Guess what? What are you going to do about it? And the answer is, they don't have an answer. Uh, and we're already seeing the earthquakes of that in Europe right now in the farmer protests in Germany and in Sweden and in France because their environmental policies have become so disconnected uh, it, with reality that is now showing up in the economic area. When we canceled the Keystone Pipeline here in this country right after President Biden came into office, uh, you know, that's in, first of all, you saw the price of oil shoot way up through the roof. Who would have guessed? Who would have guessed? Uh, but in Pakistan, they had riots mm -hmm. because that shoved so many families below subsistence level. So in the third world, these are crises, you know, mm -hmm. because the, the value of oil is settled on the global market every day in London and in New York. And right now, it's being settled in dollars, but there's a move to move away from that. Between Russia and China, they're trying to settle it in yuan or, you know, get away from the U.S., being the hegemon of the whole monetary system that came about ever since the 1970s and the OPEC crisis that we had. 
Uh, and if that happens, it's that ability to offload our debt into the third world that has enabled us to keep spending blindly, even though we're $34 trillion in debt. Well, how does that affect the Middle East? Well, you're going to have crises in the countries that are putting pressure on Israel. It's almost like God said this, all right? You're going to make trouble for Israel. I am going to make trouble for you. Mm -hmm. uh, but oil comes from the Middle East, and that's affecting the politics that are going on there. Uh, Prince Mohammed bin Sultan of Saudi Arabia, he's going to have a hard sell on this one. Uh, to the king. But he understands he has to be a visionary. The Saudi oil fields are in decline. And when the fields go into decline, they don't renew. And they haven't found any new oil fields. And, and Prince uh, Sultan understands that there is not a high demand on the world market for sand. And that's the only other product that it seems like Saudi Arabia can sell right Lots now. Lots of sand. Right. Okay. So he understands we need to remake Saudi Arabia. It needs to become a tourist center and he's going to battle uphill against conservative Wahhabi Muslims who will object to that because it's the home of Mecca and Medina, the center of Islam. He's going to have a hard sell to, to, the, uh, to the king, but he also knows that their enemy is Iran. Iran, a Shiite country versus Saudi Arabia, a Sunni country. And the radical groups, Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran, and some of the other uh, Palestinian, I'm sorry, not Palestinian, but Islamic extremist groups have not only been against Israel or against the West, they are also specifically against the traitor countries, Egypt, Jordan, anybody who makes a peace treaty with Israel, as far as they're concerned. Well, and this, this is the kind of factual reference point that gives the light of the narrative. And back to your original point about Marxism and its importation into the thought system of the West, the current version of it, as I understand it, are the initials CT or CRT, critical race theory. But, it, but the victim does not have to be a race. It does not have to be a gender. It can be a victim group. And so Israel and Palestine being read into that grid in the geopolitics that's cut off from a biblical worldview, Christians need to understand that there is a game being played. There is a kabuki theater happening. Yes. And this is where Christians have, it's not just knowing the Bible. It's knowing how the biblical prophetic grid actually contradicts the narrative and being pr the prevailing narrative about Israel and Hamas in this right. case. And it's understanding that in this football game of, of geopolitics, uh, in this football game, the referees, which used to be my profession, the media, mm -hmm. who was, was supposed to call foul when a, when a politician tells a yeah. lie here or there, yeah. they have decided they're going to play on one team. That's right. Okay. The black and white stripes are joining one side or the other. That's exactly yep. it. Yep. Mm -hmm. The zebras are going over to, to the other side. And ever since the late 70s and the early 80s, they began teaching in the journalism schools like Columbia. They began teaching in the broadcast schools. They were sometimes one and the same, sometimes not. That the goal now as a journalist is not to report the news. <laughs> the goal is to be a social activist, a journalist activist. And what they do, and, and this may sound like we're off topic for Israel, but we're not. We'll bring it back because everything is being seen through these filters. But what they do is if a story fits the narrative, right, drum beat, bum -ba -da, bum -ba -da, bum boom, boom, and it's on there 24-7, okay, mm -hmm. especially on the, the news channels. The they, IDF bombed a hospital. Th that's a perfect example right. of we what We talked about this last episode, right. but this is a case in point. This is the kind of thing that happens. Case in point. If it could fit the narrative... All right, and it doesn't quite. They'll bring it over and they'll twist it and distort it and shove it into the narrative and then beat the drum beat. Bum -ba -da -bum -ba -da -bum -ba -da -bum. There's no hole too round for that square peg. That's right. The third step is if it doesn't fit the narrative, it will be ignored or viciously criticized. But the fourth step's more interesting because when they're finally caught in the midst of telling lies and distortions, uh, they are incredibly slow to walk it back. And a perfect example was... That's you, when the narrative collapses, basically. That's when the narrative mm -hmm. collapses. And so they have to... Now they have egg all over their face. And how do they get out of it? Um, the, the hospital story in Gaza. The story was it was an IDF missile strike or a drone strike that had blown up this hospital. Look at all these dead civilians. Mm -hmm. Well, what it turned out to be was a Hamas missile that fell short. And the media should know that an average of 10 to 30 percent 
of their missiles and rockets go back into their own territory. These are not very reliable, homemade <laughs> little missiles. And that's what it was. Mm -hmm. Well, then they started into this long litany for days, rather than walking back the story and saying, we were wrong. It was, well, it's very difficult covering a moving situation like the Middle East. And our professionals are always trying to get it. Oh, horse run. Okay, you lied, you took what Hamas said at face value, you lied about it, you've been caught with it, just do a mea culpa and get on with it. But they won't I've do that. I've never heard that in my life, honestly. <laughs> on a thing, from no. The, what as a matter of fact, remember, remember the issue of the Covington High School men from, from Kentucky mm -hmm. that were on the Washington Mall, and it was Nick Sandman, the young man at the time, he's in his mid to late 20s now. Yep, but, uh, Christian school kid or charter Christ, school uh, kid. Catholic school kid, Catholic yeah. School. And uh, there were a group of Native Americans that were being taunted by some black Israelites. And the guys, the men from Covington High School, saw this happening. And they came to the defense of the Native Americans. All right, That's what really happened, the video showed. Well, this other Native American, who's known as being some kind of a wacko activist, gets up and he gets right up. and He's not even from the group, the, the other group. Uh, and he gets right up in Sandman's face, and that's when he's drumming. Remember that picture of him drumming? And Sandman's sitting there with this, just, he was wise. Be quiet. Don't, don't do anything. But it, they made him look like he's well, a he racist. He awkwardly smiled, remember? Right. It was the like awkward it was, smile. He was, he was ridiculing this Native American right. because he sort of smirked. And if you watch the whole video from start to finish, there's no way you could get the story. But what was it? It fit the narrative. Mm -hmm. So they That's dragged right. it over and day That's and right. day. And, over. and since that time, uh, when it was finally proven, the, the full video came out on social media. They could no longer maintain it. They went into the same, well, you know, it's really hard covering these stories. And they refused to walk it back, so much so that Nick Sandman has won two multi-million dollar defamation suits for the assault on his character. Well, and that amount of money is worth it to them because the actually the false narrative still exists. You bring it up in the same circles that are talking about Israel and even coming on our page and supposedly refuting our stance, and these collapsed narratives still get propped up like zombies. They still are. That's correct. They're still believed. They're right. still touted in the, even in the face of a total destruction of the storyline. That's because There's no air left to it. It has no oxygen. Does, but it still it it, but it still moves. It's still the horse is dead, out. prop that's it up, right. ignore that's the right. flies. That's right. right. <laughs> that's right. It's not just that it's dead. It's I can smell it from space now. Right. But it's still there. And and, and on this topic of Israel, look, it is <laughs> it is the biblical timeline that's going to keep it in front of us. Correct. But born again believers have got to stay sharp on the details, on the facts. Right. And and the problem is today is getting the facts, whether you're reading uh, European media uh, or American Canadian media, over half the population just don't trust it. Mm -hmm. And you can see this in Europe. You know, there's a big phenomenon going on in Germany with the AFD party, the Alternative for Deutschland party. Uh, and it's very right wing. They call it extreme. Anything they, the left doesn't like in Europe, they call Rex extremist and right extremists. And they've got some associations. They've had some meetings with the, the neo uh, fascist groups that are over there. But generally, they want, they understand that Europe is in trouble. Germany's had a terrible immigration policy. Uh, energy prices are too high. And they're doing the best they can to just stomp this out and create. They've had massive protests in the street about the AFD party, which has been getting very good returns. But you know what? When the polls are taken, there's no change in public opinion. All of the screaming, the shouting, the outrage hasn't moved the needle. Hasn't, hasn't moved the needle because people are no longer buying what the elites are saying. So this is the filter mm -hmm. through which the West is looking at what's going on in, in Palestine and Gaza. Okay. Well, so John, then how do we unpack this in specific light of the accusation? For example, that we Christians are supporting an apartheid state. Yeah. Uh, the first part I like is maybe we should unpack first from the river to the sea, Palestine. Shall you know, let's free. start there because that's okay. the slogan and that sticks in everybody's mind. Right. And, and, the, and remember, political activists exist on slogans. That's mm -hmm. what they do. Uh, they don't mean anything. They may be wrong, but they just say it. 
uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. What they're telling you is they want genocide of the 11 some odd million Jews that live in Israel. The, J Israel will be pushed off the map based on the narrative, another narrative created that, and it came out in this email, that Israel, the, the Jews came into the land, you know, in the beginning of the 1900s. They pushed out that this land was totally populated by Palestinians, of which nobody was using that term, by the way, until 1967. There were Arabs that were living in the, in the territories there in small villages. Uh, and that they stole their land. That was another thing that was made uh, in this email. Well, historically, as we covered last time on the, on the program here, that's simply historically not true. Uh, in the late 1800s, the majority population in Jerusalem was Jewish not Muslim. It was yeah. about probably 60% Jews, 30%. We don't have to go back to Bible times to establish that essentially it was, look, they were there. It was, it, it was Jewish Israel as recently as the 19th century. Right. Okay. So, it, there, uh, you know, you have to say there were Arab villages along the coastline. There were Arab villages on the interior. But all contemporary reports of people like National Geographic and Mark Twain from that period, from that period of time, contemporary people who visited said, "There's nothing here; it's empty space." Yes. And the Jews went in and they bought every scrap of property that they ever had yep. when the Zionist movement went to go back to their ancestral homeland, which is what Israel and Jerusalem is all about. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until the 1930s that the Muslim the Mufti of Jerusalem, Hajamin al Husseini, uh, began making trouble for the Jews because he didn't like the idea that he had all these settlers coming in. And so finally it got to 1948. And, and by the way, they say the Palestinians own this territory. That's historically not true. The territory belonged to the Turkish Ottoman Empire until 1917 when the British took it over. The Ottomans fought with Germany during the war, they lost it. The Arabs fought with the British and the French to displace the Turks, Lawrence of Arabia, and they had a right to be upset because the British had promised the Arabs they would have a state of their own, and they reneged on that promise. So you can see why the Arabs would be really upset. I have to agree with that. Yeah. But, but, but then the British held the territory, it was British territory, from 1917 until 1948, when they abandoned it and walked out and said, we can't handle this, this is crazy anymore. You got two Semitic groups and they're at each other's throats and at our throats and we just don't want to deal with it. Uh, and then the UN came up with a partition plan and said, all right, why don't we give the Jews a little state along the coastline and down in the desert and you guys can have everything else. Transjordan, by the way, was supposed to be that and it came all the way into mm -hmm. Jordan. Uh, and the Israelis said, please, we want to live in peace and prosperity with our neighbors. Let's do it together. We can have this partnership. David Ben-Gurion, first president of Israel, or first prime minister, was outspoken uh, about this. We want to have peace with our neighbors. The Arabs said no. They attacked Israel, claiming genocide. We're going to push them into the sea. In 1967, more genocide. We're going to push them into the sea. Yep. But now, if we say Palestine will be free, that's still what they're talking about. That's been the goal of Hamas, Hezbollah. I mean, it's the declared goal. Hamas was founded in 1988. And it was the declared goal of Hamas to push Israel and get rid of them, move them into the sea. However, <laughs> point of order to people who write this, Gaza was free. All right? The Israelis withdrew in 2005. Mm -hmm. They hadn't been in there since for 19 years, for Pete's sake. And they said, fine, let's try this. Let's see if we give you this chunk of land. Land for peace. Land, land for, for peace. peace. Land right. for peace. If Another we give you this chunk of land. Can you do something with it? Will this work? Uh, instead of turning it in, it, and I think about the potential for this, they could have turned it into another jewel of the Mediterranean, like Beirut, Lebanon used to be prior to the Lebanese Civil War in the 1980s. Well, and many people don't know that Lebanon was, if not predominantly, it was a strong plurality of Christian presence in Lebanon. It was a... It, it was a um, it was very different than today. Let's just put it that way. Right, very much that very much different. And uh, even that little bit of history is just not known. It was a plural society. There were Christians. It was a large Christian Lebanese Christian population, Maronite Christians, mm -hmm. 
and a large Muslim population, not so much Jewish, but it was a mix. Everybody got along. Yeah, I was going to say relatively peaceful. Relatively peaceful. People used to go there on you know vacations, holidays, the whole bit. Then the whole thing just blew apart. Mm -hmm. uh, they could have done that. Hamas could have done that. It did not do that. Hamas used it instead to turn it into a platform for continuous warfare against Israel to carry out their goal of genocide against Israel. Mm -hmm. And so for all of those years, well, especially since the Israelis withdrew since 2005, they've been launching missiles and rockets into Israel, into the kibbutzim that are there. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, when, when that happens, the world just sort of go, there goes another missile, bang, oh, look, it killed somebody. Well... Shucky do, golly willikers. Oh, whoop, there goes another missile. Bang! Now, if you and I had to live under bang on a regular basis, I think we'd get a little upset about that, you know? And who? So they didn't do it. Not only that, we now discover the United Nations, UNWAR, the agency that was set up to resettle Palestinian Arabs after the 48 war back into Israel. Now we discover that uh, up to 30 members of UNWAR, the United Nations, Peacekeepers uh, were actually involved in committing the atrocities on, uh, on October 7th of 2023. Uh, this has blown the lid off it. Yeah, another uh, narrative collapses. Another collapse narrative. Uh, Javier Gutierrez, who's currently UN Secretary General, has been freaking out because they've been caught with their hand in the cookie jar. All of the aid monies that has been flowing in from Europe, from the United States for humanitarian aid was being turned into the construction of incredibly sophisticated tunnels for Hamas to use under buildings headquarters, transport of items. We're not just talking about little dirt things like the Great Escape. This is concrete and well-designed tunnels, well-designed technology and equipment all designed to do what? To attack Israel. And in any other context, and this is Jerusalem, the stone of stumbling, in any other context, this would be world news. Just that alone, just that lid being blown off, just that expose would be Watergate times a thousand. But in this context, because it's Jerusalem, it's, it, it just has rolled back into the old narrative. Right. No right? Jews, no news. Mm -hmm. No Jews, no news. Right. <laughs> I like that line. I heard it from the ambassador, the Israeli ambassador to the United States. And you know what he was pointing out? If you want to talk about relative, let's get to genocide, because they're saying there's genocide. Well, Israel's not committing genocide in Gaza. Israel is determined to get Hamas. Uh, Israel is probably one of the most moral armies in the world. Now, can you imagine during World War II, uh, you have, if you remember, Dwight D. Eisenhower at the time was supreme commander of the Allied forces in Europe over both. I read about him. I'm not old enough, John. You're not old, old enough. As See, I remember when he was president. Okay, he later became President Eisenhower just before President Kennedy was, was president. Uh, can you see Dwight Eisenhower picking up the phone? Remember, we had dial phones, <laughs> yes. not uh, beep boop up. Uh, he hello? Uh, Ad Adolf? Yeah, Adolf, G good. Y yes, this is Dwight Eisenhower. Yes. How is it down there in the bunker? L little cramped, a little stuffy. Okay. Listen, I just thought we'd tell you we're going to be dropping some bombs on Unter den Linden in Berlin today, and, and maybe we'll go down the Tier Garden and firebomb it. Uh, but we wanted to let you know about that ahead of time. Now, think about that during World War II. But that's what Israel that's does. That's literally what, that, what they do now. That's that what they do. Rules of engagement. Rules of Israel. engagement. We're not there to kill civilians. Civilians are always going to be killed in war. War is a terrible, terrible, terrible thing. I hate it. But the Bible tells us until the end, you know, in Daniel, there shall be war. Well, and I, I'm always interested in the double standard, which is what you just highlighted. I mean, yeah. it's crazy to think of Eisenhower having this kind of conversation with Hitler. It's not only utterly reasonable to expect this of Israel, but it's treated as a human right. It's treated as a right. It's and let me show you the ratios, though. Uh, based on, and by the way, we, we don't have good statistics of how many civilians versus how many combatants are being killed because Hamas doesn't tell us the difference. And the media get their numbers from Hamas. They just queue up and say, tell us what to say. So here you have a, a terrorist group telling the media what to say, and the media just report that. But even if we take the current statistics at somewhat face value, the ratio of, and it's just cruel statistics, I have to admit this, Jason, uh, civilians to combatants killed, it's about 1.5 to 1. That's astonishing. But, but the United Nations norm 
for world global conflict is nine to one. Okay, so now they're down in Rafa, as as we will round out this week's conversation. But now they're they're talking about going into Rafa, the last town on the southern border to eliminate Hamas. They know that the civilian populations have to go somewhere. Egypt is now talking about opening up their border, which they've held solidly shut. Another Arab Muslim country doesn't want Palestinians. Okay, they're going to open it up and they're going to try to create camps and places for them to go. But Israel's not going to back down because they said, no, this group has been out to kill us. We are going to exterminate them. Not the Palestinian people, not the civilians, but it's the Palestinians, the Hamas, that deliberately puts the civilians in between Israel and them. So if anybody should be accused of genocide and of war violations, this is a specific violation of international law, it should be Hamas, not, uh, not Israel right Agreed. Now. Very good. John, I continue to be intrigued by this. I know that further developments will continue to expose the flawed narrative that we've been talking about. Jerusalem will continue to be the stone of stumbling, but not for born-again believers who are awake, who are watching, who are testing everything with the grid of Scripture. And so we're going to come back to this, but for now, I want to thank our viewers with Candlelight and our community and our viewing audience. And thank you, John. Thanks once again for opening up this topic for us, and we will return to this next time. God bless you, and have a great day.